Hello, I'm Dr. Kevin Huguet with Bay Surgical Weight Loss. Welcome to the seminar. We are going to talk about weight loss surgery today. I am the medical director of the weight loss surgery program here at St. Anthony's Hospital. My background uh, and interest in weight loss surgery started before I went to med school. I was a personal fitness trainer uh, where I developed an interest in obesity and that's carried forward into uh, my career now. I trained at the Mayo Clinic and also underwent a fellowship at the Mayo Clinic in bariatric or weight loss surgery. Today's seminar is just the first step of your journey. I view weight loss surgery as uh, just one component of an entire lifestyle change that you'll be going through. Uh, weight loss surgery is considered a tool and if you view it as a tool, uh, you'll be extremely successful for weight loss. My job as your surgeon is not only to perform your surgery, but to coach you through the whole process as well. So let's just start out. Basically the seminar is uh, going to be a discussion about different weight loss surgery options. Uh, so we're basically going to start off with talking about uh, obesity and how dangerous it is. And then uh, from there we'll go over the different weight loss surgery options. And then from there we'll probably focus mostly on treating obesity with the sleeve gastrectomy. Obesity is a lifelong illness and it is the number one cause of preventable death in the United States. Uh, it used to be number two behind smoking and now uh, it's gotten actually uh, more prevalent and therefore it has now uh, increased uh, your risks of death with obesity. It affects nearly 40% of the U.S. population. It is an epidemic in the United States. It's very expensive. It costs up to $147 billion a year. On average, uh, Americans spend about $1,500 or more a year uh, on obesity or obesity related products. Uh, and, and one part of obesity that patients don't often think of, with treating obesity, uh, there is actually a financial savings. Uh, all of our discussion today is really going to focus on uh, the medical benefits of obesity, but there is one little sidebar here about the financial benefits. Uh, studies have shown that uh, patients can spend anywhere up to $17,000 a year uh, in money spent on illnesses uh, related to obesity, like high blood pressure, diabetes, going to the doctor, um, and missed work and medications, and so all that adds up. And so once you have surgery, a lot of your illnesses from obesity uh, will subside, and therefore your money spent will also subside. Uh, and also, you eat about a third of what you eat uh, right now as an obese patient, and with that comes the savings as well. So there is a financial impact. Patients often ask, well, what's my return on investment? Say, if I pay for this, when will I get my money back um, with all of these savings? And studies show anywhere between, say, three and five years, uh, you would basically get paid back uh, in finances through your savings. Uh, obesity is classified based on your body mass index. That's a number we use to calculate your weight. It's basically where they take your height and your weight, put it into a formula, and come up with your number. We can't just use your raw weight because it really is dependent on how tall you are to whether you'd be a candidate for surgery. So it's uh, broken down into three categories. Uh, there's class one, class two, and class three obesity. And that's all based on your BMI. Most patients with a BMI over 40 uh, qualify for surgery with comorbidities. Once you get down to class one and two, those are patients we really focus on with diabetes uh, and, and treating it as a metabolic surgery option. Uh, interestingly, it's uh, now a recommendation of the American Diabetes Association that uh, patients uh, with these lower BMI numbers and diabetes should strongly consider surgery as a treatment modality for the diabetes if uh, their current plan isn't working. We're going to show you several slides in a row and that basically is to give you an idea of how prevalent obesity has uh, become over, say, the past uh, 35 years. So uh, this is dating back just to 1985, and they've, they've colored the states that they have the data on as light blue or dark blue. Dark blue would be greater than a 10% incidence of obesity in that state. So we're going to roll through these states, and you'll see as uh, we roll through that now most of the states are greater than 10%, and this is just five years later. Uh, and as we keep moving on, um, uh, this would be another five years, and now we're up to greater than 15%. Uh, and now we're into tan or yellow, which means we're greater than 20% in most states. And now we're to these kind of red and black states, meaning greater than 30% prevalence uh, of obesity in those states. 
And so as we keep moving on here, we'll see that uh, we're all the way up to 2015 and we're greater than 35%. And you can see it's just, um, every state is just getting um, more and more prevalent. And then if we go on to uh, data from say 2016 and then 2017 and 2018, uh, you'll see that uh, now it, it's got a prevalence of about 39.40% uh, prevalence in the United States as of 2018, which is the most recent data that we have. Uh, and you can see that it's greater than 35% uh, in the states shown here in dark red. So it's, it's a prevalent illness. Um, you're not alone in your battle with obesity. And this shows you that it's a very common problem. Uh, surgery is something that um, is also become more common as a treatment for obesity uh, because it's now much more safer. It used to be seen as something that was maybe dangerous and so people were afraid to have surgery. Uh, but now patients are realizing, no, it's very safe, uh, particularly the, one of the operations called the sleeve gastrectomy we'll talk about. And so people are much more open-minded about having an operation for obesity. So uh, what are the causes of obesity? And people often say, why am I like this? Uh, is it my fault? And you know, I think there's a mixed answer to that. Uh, I think there are genetic causes which have a lot to do with it. Uh, and oftentimes I'll, I'll have a patient maybe that has a sibling uh, who eats the same thing as my patient but is for some reason doesn't suffer from obesity. And I see that very commonly. I, I think it really comes down to the way your body uh, processes food and something called the set point theory which we'll get into a little later in, in the presentation. But it, it just comes down to it. it's, it's the way that um, your body processes food in addition to uh, excess calories going in. So there, there's not one thing you can put your finger at and say that's the cause of my problem. Usually it's multifactorial. There's environmental factors, um, there's physiologic factors, and then there's uh, obviously psychosocial factors involved with uh, what's causing people to eat and, and certain calorie intakes. So on to the uh, limitations that obesity causes you and how it affects your lifestyle. And, and you know this isn't something I think I really need to focus on too much because you're all well aware of uh, the effects it has on your life and, and the limitations that you suffer. Um, just doing simple things like going upstairs, personal hygiene, and flying in a plane, um, all of the, the things that, that patients uh, say they can do now much easier after they've lost weight with surgery. Uh, in time, obesity also affects so many different organs in your body, including your joints, and arthritis is a long-term effect I see, and I would say over 90% of my patients with obesity. Uh, most patients think that, oh, well, surgery is just a way out, that's incorrect, or surgery is just cosmetic, and I only want that, people only want that because uh, they want to look better, and honestly, that, that's a nice side effect of what we do for surgery, but my focus as a surgeon really isn't so much uh, you having an output, an outcome that's, uh, that's cosmetic, it's more to get rid of the illnesses uh, that are caused by obesity, because uh, having obesity causes a lot of organ damage in your body and so uh, surgery kind of gets rid of that risk for the organ damage and the organ damage would be from things like diabetes, hypertension, uh, hypercholesterolemia, all of these things cause significant damage to particularly the diabetes and that's my main focal point is if you have diabetes let's try to get into remission or let's prevent you from getting it because I would say it's probably the single most dangerous thing that you can have with obesity. You can get heart problems, uh, problems with your circulation, just about every organ in your body is affected by it. And so um, I think that, that plays a serious role in, in why we treat obesity. So here is kind of what I was describing is all the organ systems that, that are affected by obesity. And um, they're all highlighted here. You can say, well, that's every organ in my abdomen and my chest. And you're right, every organ in your body is affected by obesity. Uh, it increases your rate of death when you compare yourself to, say, the general population by a significant amount. Uh, and then it affects your lungs, shown here, your liver, your gallbladder, um, arthritis, uh, stroke, heart failure, uh, and then increase your risk of cancer. So all of these things are, 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 are not to be taken lightly, uh, and there are reasons that you should seriously think about uh, obesity and treating it very seriously. And, and what we need to think about is a long-term answer for this because anything in the short term doesn't really matter in my opinion. Uh, you can say for example uh, lose a hundred pounds five times in your lifetime but at the end of it all uh, it doesn't really matter because the average weight is, is, is still there and so you still have all the organ damage. So it, 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 one of the things I mentioned earlier was maybe it's a way out but it's really it, it's, it's a way to keep the weight off and that's why I don't see it as a way out because 
medical plans fail the majority of the time. The majority being, say, around 90 to 95% of the time. Uh, if you lose weight on your own, you will regain the weight. And that's shown out in multiple studies. So uh, what surgery offers is a permanent answer to keep the weight off. How does it help you? Um, and uh, what, are, what, what do I expect afterwards for improvement? Uh, and with surgery, uh, we would expect somewhere around a 60% excess weight loss. Um, it takes about a year or two to get there, most of the time in the first year. And so what, what does that number mean, 60% excess weight? So what that means is uh, you take your weight, you take the extra weight on your body, uh, and so you subtract your ideal weight, and then you come up with your excess weight. And say you're 100 pounds overweight, that's your excess weight. Then we take a percent of that, and that's how we kind of give you an average number of expected weight loss. So 100 pounds overweight, you'd expect to lose about 60 pounds. 200 pounds overweight, you lose about 120 pounds, is, is what we quote. And that usually occurs mostly in the first year. This shows you the different organ systems and how they improve after surgery. And the three things that I like to focus on are uh, sleep apnea. Uh, a lot of my patients have sleep apnea and the resolution rate with that is anywhere between 70 and 90 percent. Uh, diabetes uh, is another very important one we talked about and the resolution rate with that is quite variable between 60 and 80 percent depending on the studies you look at. And then hypertension. Uh, that would be another one that's very common and we either have a very high remission rate or most patients will go down on their requirements for uh, hypertension medications. This is another slide just to kind of give you an idea of the life-changing results from bariatric surgery. So on the um, side of the slide it gives you um, the improvement in all of these medical problems that patients experience. And uh, again we've got an 88% resolution in sleep apnea. Uh, we've decreased rate of heart failure about 72% of the time. Uh, this study showed about an 80% improvement or resolution in diabetes. Uh, and then on and on the list goes from, heart, uh, from reflux to hip pain to um, uh, incontinence issues, uh, high cholesterol, migraines, all of these things are affected uh, by obesity. So, and so what are the treatment options for uh, uh, weight loss surgery? There are two primary surgeries done in the United States these days. There is the uh, laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy and the laparoscopic gastric bypass. And those would be at the very top of the pyramid. Um, and, and this kind of gives you an idea of all of the different plans that eventually lead up to surgery. Uh, it starts with lifestyle modifications and those would be permanent changes in the way you're eating and exercise. And that is something that we encourage for everybody as part of a dietary program um, for surgery is lifestyle modification. Uh, whatever we do has got to be a permanent change for you. And so uh, if it's surgery, uh, you're going to have a permanent lifestyle change with surgery. If it's your own lifestyle changes, that's fine, but a temporary diet will not work in the long term and that's the key point here. Uh, you know, there are these commercial weight loss plans, meal replacement plans, and medications, and all of those fall into the same bucket, in my opinion, which is medical weight loss. And that's where the failure rate is somewhere around 90 to 95 percent in the long term. If you took all those patients and watched them, uh, you'd see that they lost weight, but then they regained it in a year or two. And you've gone through it yourself, I'm sure, where uh, you've lost a good 60, 70 pounds, and then within a year or two you've regained it, and usually you come back up over what you originally weighed. And so the benefit with surgery is it's more of a permanent solution where you should lose the weight and it should stay off and that's our goal for you. Different treatment options are listed here and you can also see this table compares uh, the difference in um, the medical plans versus surgery. And you can see that with a medical plan you might lose, if you take everybody on average up to 10% of your excess weight, uh, with surgery, you lose somewhere between 50 and 70. So I quote a number usually about 60% for the sleep gastrectomy. So uh, why is this so difficult? Why, why is it that uh, you, you can't seem to keep the weight off? Um, and I have a reason for that. And it, it's a kind of a, a, a theory that we've created uh, and it kind of put a phrase on it called your set point. And it's basically uh, where we think your body wants to set at. It's kind of like, think of it like a thermostat. Uh, it's a set point for where your body wants to be. And uh, you can lose weight on your own, but it does not change that set point. And that's what you're seeing here. You can lose weight, and that set point is this line here, but eventually you're gonna gain it back. And usually you hear this yo-yo effect where you lose weight, you gain it back, and usually you kind of go back up above your set point, and you kind of move along this line of where your set point is. 
It's kind of a uh, genetically predetermined line, in my opinion, an area where your body wants to sit in your adult life. And it tends to go up over your uh, period of aging as well, I feel like. So medically treating obesity doesn't change that set point. It doesn't physiologically change anything in your body. So um, you, you lose weight, but your body doesn't forget that set point. So typically uh, you'll lose it and then it remembers where it was at and you're hungry and, and you're, you're fighting it off. Eventually you give in and you eat and regain that weight. Or you stop the plan you were on eventually and then you regain the weight. Surgery alters the anatomy in your body. And that's how, um, in my mind, I, I think of this working, is it changes the set point to a lower number. And then by bringing your set point down, that's your new kind of comfort zone. That's your new set point or your new target. Uh, and so that's more where your body is comfortable staying. And that's why uh, you should have a, a more permanent weight loss because uh, you have a, a lower number where your body is now happy. Uh, it, it, your appetite is lower uh, and uh, you, you're not uh, ferociously hungry when you're down. And so your body should stay at that set point. Uh, and so that's the difference with surgery versus medical isn't that it's a way out. It's just a more permanent solution um, to lowering your set point so that you can keep the weight off of your body. So uh, who is a candidate for surgery? And it's all based on that BMI number we talked about earlier. Uh, and it really is dependent on your insurance plan. General guidelines we follow is if your BMI is over 40, usually a candidate for surgery. A lot of times I do like to see other comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, sleep apnea. Uh, when your BMI is below 40, uh, then typically between say 30 and 40, uh, they like to see diabetes or other illnesses. Um, if you're using this as a metabolic surgery, uh, those are people with a BMI between say 30 and 35, you would need to have diabetes to, to qualify under that uh, lower BMI number. Uh, so uh, th that would be the breakdown of BMI. That's something we go over with you. Uh, when you first reach out, we calculate your BMI and decide um, where you would sit in that qualification. So how do we do the surgery? Um, what we're going to talk about here is a sleeve gastrectomy and a little bit about a gastric bypass. Those are the two main operations in the United States. There are other operations you might hear about. Um, one would be like the laparoscopic gastric banding, and that's something that has kind of come and gone. Uh, it's something that uh, was uh, prevalent, I'd say, about so five to ten years ago, and we found it had higher long-term complications, a higher reoperation rate, and less weight loss. So uh, it was attractive to patients because it was reversible, but it really wasn't a good long-term solution. So now most of the time we're taking out bands uh, because we're finding it just has a lot of issues in the long term. So that one's kind of out. And that leaves us with these two options, which is the gastric bypass and the laparoscopic sleep gastrectomy. Now there are other operations out there that you might hear about, but we're not really gonna focus on those because those are done probably less than one to 2% of the time here in the United States. So we're gonna talk mainly about the sleep gastrectomy and we do that with those little incisions. Uh, and we go in through several little incisions in your abdomen. Uh, we have a video that we can show you too. Um, it, it's something that shows how we go in with little incisions. Uh, we uh, basically take a stapler and we divide the stomach with the stapler and we remove about 80% of the stomach. On average, the surgery takes about 20 to 30 minutes and it's a one night stay in the hospital typically. People often ask, uh, what's the risk of removing that much of my stomach? And generally we don't have any long-term risks uh, that we worry about with vitamin deficiencies and things. Uh, we do check a B12 level in our patients, uh, usually the one year mark, but it, it's rare that I've seen, and I, I don't think I've ever seen it doing the hundreds I've done of a low B12 level. So basically it reduces a hormone called ghrelin in your body. And by reducing that, you have less of an appetite. Uh, and so you're not hungry and you don't want to eat. And that's why it's more of a long-term solution uh, for weight loss. We expect you to lose about 60% of your excess weight with the sleeve gastrectomy. And the nice thing is you don't have any of your intestines or bypassed or anything like that. Your food goes down, it's normal digestive pathway uh, as it does right now. And so you don't worry about um, uh, things like the dumping syndrome people hear about. It's something that's just for more of the gastric bypass. You don't really see that with the sleeve um, or any of the malabsorption issues with diarrhea or vitamin deficiencies. We don't typically see that with the sleeve. The main thing patients uh, will experience is just restriction on how much you can eat afterwards. Uh, which is what we're looking for. 
So it's a very safe surgery, generally a very low risk surgery. Uh, some of the things that we talk about as risks for surgery are something called a leak and that is where this staple line can leak. Uh, it's very, very low risk, usually less than like 1%. And if it occurs, it's usually up higher on the staple line and uh, it might mean more surgery or other procedures to fix the problem. So it is something to be aware of, but uh, not something that we see a lot of, fortunately. Uh, the other thing is uh, reflux disease. And so those are the two things I mainly talk to patients about, a leak and heartburn. If you have heartburn already, it can get a little worse. A lot of times with the weight loss, it will get better. Uh, some people develop more heartburn after surgery, so it's something to be aware of. Uh, if you have uh, severe heartburn and there are changes in the lining of your esophagus from the heartburn, sometimes we encourage you to think about another operation like a gastric bypass uh, because of the risk of it getting worse with this operation. So. Uh, and then there are other risks uh, such as uh, a stenosis or a stricture and bleeding which we see with uh, the sleeve. Again, those are all less than 1%. So overall, I think it is a very safe surgery. Um, I, I compare it um, in my practice to um, some, uh, as one of the safest things that I do as compared to like a gallbladder surgery or something like that. Uh, it is uh, one of the safest things that, uh, that I think we do and we do a very good job with it. Uh, overall, um, patients are very satisfied, very successful, and uh, I think it's, it's a great operation. Um, the gastric bypass is the other operation. We do that probably less than 5 to 10 percent of the time, um, and there are certain candidates who would get that. Uh, and th that is where you basically staple off the stomach and then you reroute the intestinal contents. So it works two ways. One is by restriction, and then the other one is the malabsorption, uh, where you're not digesting food in its normal pathway. So that's the difference with the gastric bypass. And it has its own set of complications. Uh, overall, uh, it, it does have a more effective rate of weight loss. In other words, you may lose more weight with it, but then the price to pay is, is it is, does have a higher complication rate. Uh, where you have ulcers can form, uh, where your attachment is, uh, you can have malabsorption of vitamins. Sometimes you can lose too much weight, chronic diarrhea, uh, dumping syndrome is something. So, all of these things are really more related to a bypass, and that's why I think people have been not so excited about having this done, but with the sleeve gastrectomy, it kind of seems like a more safe, well-tolerated operation, so a lot more patients are interested in sleeve gastrectomies uh, these days. Now, talking about the surgery and what can you expect after the operation, you know, a lot of these are questions that patients ask as part of your normal recovery. So um, the surgery, as I said earlier, takes about 30 minutes uh, and it's a one night stay in the hospital. How painful is surgery? Well, typically uh, there's one incision that hurts. We go in with several little ones, but one's particularly painful where we actually extract the stomach. Uh, and on the website, <clears throat> you can actually watch a real video of the operation if you care to. It's a five minute narrated video and you'll see that area that we're talking about where we remove the stomach and exactly how we staple off the stomach. Uh, and so uh, that site hurts usually for a few days up to a week and it's not severe pain. Uh, usually people go back to work and I'd say about uh, a week and back to normal by about two weeks. Uh, we do give you a handout with activity limitations and that goes on for six weeks after surgery. And the, the main thing is use pain as a guide and don't lift over like 50 pounds. If you do those two things then you'll, you'll, you'll have a safe recovery and not have any problems. So, uh, and how long will I be in the hospital afterwards? Typically a one night hospital stay. So you have surgery and you go home following, the following morning typically if things go as planned. Uh, and uh, back to work in a week. Um, do I have to lose weight before surgery? Uh, the answer is typically no, I, I, unless you're at a high risk category and that would be determined um, on your consultation. And, and usually patients that are, are, are super obese or you have a very high BMI number, like above 70, then we talk about weight loss uh, before we can go to surgery to make surgery safer. And to that point, um, we do put you on a special diet before surgery. And that diet is a liquid diet and it's a calorie limited diet for two weeks. Uh, with obesity, your liver is enlarged and so uh, we like you to go on this diet to shrink your liver and you, you lose about 15 to 20 pounds with the diet but the more, most important thing is a lot of that weight comes from your liver because your liver is in the way and uh, if it's enlarged it's possible we could get in there and not be able to do your surgery and so therefore we, we give you this diet to shrink the liver to prevent damage to your liver to prevent bleeding and to make sure we have a safe operation we can move forward with 
So that's something that you'll be educated about as you meet with dietitians. They'll give you that diet plan uh, that you'll, you'll be on for two weeks beforehand. The diet after surgery is very complex, and so we have you meet with a dietitian. Uh, we give you a manual, and in the manual it goes over all the phases of the diet. Uh, the point of uh, the diet afterwards is, number one, getting used to your new stomach, and number two, to prevent damage to your stomach because once we do this surgery you get swelling at the staple line and so uh, you're only able to actually drink liquids initially because there's so much swelling there if you were to try to eat something solid right away it could get stuck more importantly you could damage that staple line and cause a leak and that's dangerous so you've got to take it seriously really make sure you understand that we have you meet with the dietitian and, and they go over it in very good detail and there's a, a shopping list of grocery items there's menus so they really go over it in, in, in extensive detail to make sure you have a good understanding but it is something to really pay attention to because it's very important and uh, what about excess skin so that's something that um, it, it, it occasionally is a problem I think it happens uh, less frequently than patients expect it to. It has to do with where on your body you lose the weight where you carry your weight uh, and their age, whether you smoke and the health of your skin and things. So several factors at play. Uh, if it does happen, it's okay. We, we do have a solution where we there's skin removal surgery if needed though. So what are your next steps to uh, make it to surgery? What do you have to do next? Well, typically uh, after uh, you review the seminar, we have you meet with uh, the surgeon as a consultation. And that's our pathway to surgery. So first it's a seminar, and then we have forms to fill out, and then you do your surgeon consultation. After we meet in the office and uh, figure out if you're a good candidate for surgery, the next step is to meet with our bariatric coordinator. The bariatric coordinator from there will then organize all your appointments and set everything up for you. Uh, you may say, well, what do I need to do? Well, it really depends on your insurance. I can tell you some general guidelines for what patients need to do uh, after uh, uh, they've met with me. We order uh, what we call a nutrition or dietitian consultation for everybody, and that you meet with them at least twice, and they go over the booklet and make sure you understand the diet very thoroughly. You meet with an exercise specialist just to make sure you know how to exercise. And patients say, well, I already know how. Well, that's good, but we do like you to meet with them to make sure that you're doing the right things. And then patients also say, well, I've got bad arthritis. I can't exercise. Well, those are the best candidates for this because they show you ways around your arthritis problems and safe ways to exercise. So things like water aerobics and things are what they teach you so that um, um, you do incorporate exercise at this whole entire lifestyle change that we're trying to put you through. Uh, and if you think of it as a tool, it'll help you reach your goal. And the number we give you for your weight loss is not a limitation. Uh, it is a, uh, a ballpark number to give you an average. Uh, and so if whatever goal you set, this tool will help you reach that goal. If you see it that way, then you usually are very successful as long as you have your mindset on the target. Beyond that, they do organize an appointment with a psychologist, and that is just to make sure there's no underlying eating disorder and it's an insurance requirement. Beyond that, there are other tests like an upper endoscopy we would need uh, to make sure you don't have ulcers in your stomach and things like that. Uh, and then other tests depend specifically on the patient, whether you need a sleep study or, or, or clearance with your heart doctor and things like that, we would go over in the office. So. But uh, I think that's going to wrap it up for today. I uh, appreciate you all watching the seminar, and I hope to see you in the office. If you have any questions for us or my staff, feel free to reach out. We're happy to chat on the phone as well.